esteemed members of the profession, good evening. Uh, welcome to today's session. If you can hear me, just uh, send a chat on the chat box. Uh, let us know which uh, branch of PSK you're joining us from. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. If you can hear me, just send a message on the chat. Let us know which PSK branch you're joining us from. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jifa from Nairobi. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. David Muller. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjan and Duta. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining, Dr. Daniel Karimi. Yes, now I can see, you can all hear me now. Uh, Dr. Linda Opanga from Nairobi, Dr. Samuel Ocheng from Kisumu. Welcome to this meeting. Dr. Nelson from Kisumu, Dr. Nixon from Nairobi. Welcome to this webinar. Dr. Geoffrey from Meru. If you see, if you see your branch is not represented, uh, you can just send a message. Dr. Gomeshe from Addis Ababa, uh, that's Ethiopia, welcome. Dr. Dawal from India, Karibu. Chris Odungo, uh, from Elomatic Partners in East Africa, welcome. Dr. Rebecca Waweru from Nakuru, Dr. Silika Baragu, hello. Dr. Wilson from Machakos, welcome, welcome. Our colleagues from India, you're very much welcome to this event. Meanwhile, you can be reminding your colleagues to join us. We'll be starting at exactly 7 or 7 p.m. Thank you for joining, Dr. Jamila from Bungoma, Dr. Millicent from Nyeri, welcome. All right, uh, good evening once again, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's webinar is about uh, facilitating the end game of uh, GMP facility. And uh, we have uh, various speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Wilberforce Wanyanga, the Executive Director of PharmaQ Limited. We also have Mr. Abe Ranjan, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Elomatic India. And finally, we have Mr. Yogesh Chaube, 
who's the, the general manager, process and regulatory Elomatic India. And I'll be your moderator today. My name is uh, Hezron Munyakin. I'm the head of communications at PSK. So uh, before we start, I'll just take you through a few ground rules. And first it's to thank you for participating in this session. And I'll also remind you that you'll be muted during the entire course of this session. So if you have any questions, kindly use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the window and your questions are going to be answered by your presenters at the end of the session. For, for PSK members, uh, if you've not already done so, please kindly subscribe on the PPB portal. And uh, how you're going to find this event is uh, once you log in into the, PSK, the PPB events portal, uh, just search for the word GMP and you'll be able to find the name of this event. Uh, briefly, uh, I'll take you through the agenda. And first, we'll be having the presentation by Dr. Wanyanga. And then we'll have a presentation by our team from Elomatic India. That is uh, Mr. Abir Ranjan and uh, Mr. Yogesh. So at this point, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Ms. Dr. Wanyanga, to just uh, give his uh, presentation. Dr. Wanyanga, welcome. Good evening, all. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to this platform to join with my colleagues, uh, Yugesh and uh, uh, and Ujai from India and uh, Rajan. Thank you very much for being in Kenya on platform on this platform. I want just to say how happy I am. Uh, to join PSK in deliberating on this matter of um, facilitating the end game of GMP facilities. Uh, my talk will be very brief. I'll major I'll focus on the historical aspects that Kenya has gone through. Uh, as we move towards the the GMP journey. Uh, let me say also from the onset that this has been a long journey, but we are getting there. We are doing very well. Save for a few hitches here and there, which will not be part of my discussion. My discussion is really to look at the historical aspects and how we have gone, uh, where we have uh, been to it. First of all, uh, we have about 35 licensed local pharmaceutical manufacturers. At the moment, there is a high level of government will and government support. At least it's the lips of the leaders from the president to the ministers and so forth. We have a vibrant and growing local manufacturing industry. And uh, most of our industries, the origin is they were distributors before they came into manufacturing. So there was a time when there was a mixed end between uh, distributorship and manufacturing. Kenya is deemed, or it is a pharmaceutical manufacturing hub within East African community or within Comesa, if you like it, and indeed uh, uh, IGAD. And most of the manufacturers that we have uh, said manufacture the formulations of tablets, capsules, dry syrups, oral uh, liquids, um, ointments, creams, and so forth, uh, uh, sterile products. And I think uh, in the coming uh, days, we may see a little bit of uh, vaccine manufacturing. We had, if I look back at the um, pre uh, independent era, we had companies uh, which, the first company which was set up in Kenya was in the 1930s, Glaxo. And then 1947, we had other companies that were set up 
for manufacturing Kenya Overseas Company is long gone. And then in 1944, we had Mayer and Baker, which stayed for some time. And then 1953, Glaxo, I think, moved to become, um, uh, they started Sterling Winthrop. And Sterling Winthrop has gone through uh, its uh, maturation stage. Uh, later on, we'll see that it became GSK. And then, of course, in 1955, Barrows Welcome East Africa was born, was established here. And 1961, we had uh, a few other companies coming up, Aspro Nicholas and uh, Ellis, which later became uh, established L uh, the manufacturing sector, Ellis Chemical Industries. Most of you who are of age may remember Aspro Nidawaya Kweli. It was a very popular song uh, advert in the uh, on the radio, Asbro Nidawa Yakweli, and I think it it went to rest not long so long ago. Then we had the era post independent era, when other companies started uh, coming up, Lab and Allied. We had then uh, uh, 1974 Dow Pharmaceuticals, which was a joint vendor between uh, Kenyan government and Yugoslav government. This was a gift to the Kenyan government because of the friendship that existed between Mzee Jomo Kenyatta and the Yugoslav uh, government. Uh, later on, of course, it became Dow Limited, and in 2021, it has uh, become Dow Life Sciences. Cosmos was established thereafter in uh, 1978. Cosmos, you remember, if you may recall, or those ones of your age also, you know that it was the first company a recipient of uh, voluntary licensing from GSK and Boringa Engelheim to manufacture ARVs. The 1989 uh, Welcome Trust was set up in Kabete. And this period, uh, post-colonial time, we have seen uh, uh, PSK uh, 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 getting into the scene. We had also, we are seeing the civil society getting into the scene, which I'll mention a little bit later, and uh, uh, the, the, the quite a number of activities were now shaping up post-independence. Then we had the, what I call the HIV AIDS era from 19, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, 1994, first of all, before that was uh, the PSK was getting active. I remember I was very much involved in this, setting up the uh, GMP aspects of the local industry. And we had a documentary a uh, video quality that shows. I still have that video and I think we need to repeat it for some, some other time. In 1999, the Kenya government declared um, HIV AIDS as a national disaster. And this started, uh, things started happening quite a lot after this time. There was GSK, Maja with Glaxo Welcome and Smith Clam. Uh, which was, um, it was uh, which came into being because of that merger. And then at the same time, in 2001, we had the Industrial uh, Property Act with flex uh, trip flexibilities and Doha declaration uh, uh, items, considerations. This was the time we were really looking at uh, the HIV AIDS, which had no cure at the time. You remember 1999, uh, Kenya had declared HIV AIDS as a national disaster. And this Industrial uh, Property Act came into being. I should also mention that uh, this is the time we had uh, Cameron, Cameron, which was uh, one of the earliest uh, patented products for the 
management of uh, HIV AIDS. In 2004, uh, after a lot of uh, uh, activity from the civil society and uh, other interests groups, Cosmos was the first local manufacturer to make ARVs. And this arose because well, we are looking at that time at access issues, which uh, were very difficult. It used to cost more than 100,000 US dollars to treat one patient in a year. And the question then was that that was unaffordable and reachable and something had to be done. So the civil society together with some of us who are in the government and uh, they were just come out, uh, resigned, uh, retired from the government, we are urging the local manufacturers to take up the queue. Beyond that, a lot more activities took place. In 2005-2007, we had the Kenya Peaks project, uh, which was a, 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 a private public project on, uh, between the uh, German government, the Bekeka, which was there, FKPM, and I was coordinating the whole thing. Uh, this was the improvement of the drug quality for local manufacturing in Kenya, Tanzania, and Syria. I mention this because at that time, the German government was looking for manufacturers within um, nearer troubled areas. And Kenya had been identified and Tanzania that there are trouble spots in uh, within Eastern Africa and they needed some reliable manufacturers who could then be able to supply at short notice. Syria at that time was at peace because Middle East was burning and uh, the, the, the support also extended to, in, um, to Syria, um, Syria. In 2008, uh, Vision 2030 was, uh, was established this was to transform Kenya into a newly industrializing middle-income country to provide high quality of life by 2030 in a clean and secure environment. In 2011 and 2019, UNIDO came on the ground. It was a pro global project of strengthening the local production of essential medicines in the, in the least developing countries. And uh, uh, that time I was co I coordinated the, the activity that gave birth to a lot of improvement in the pharmaceutical sector. And that was uh, really under the umbrella of uh, PharmaQ. In 2011, we saw uh, universal getting a WHO PK pre-qualification for ARV technology transfer. And in 2012, we saw two activities here, sessional paper, Kenya National Pharmaceutical Policy was launched. Uh, this was an improvement from an earlier one, which was, uh, uh, it was an update from 1994, uh, the Kenyan National uh, Pharmaceutical Policy. And it included the provision for strengthening the local pharmaceutical industry. And then in 2012, the same year, is when we uh, uh, established also a Kenya Pharmaceutical Development Strategy, which contains seven uh, key principal items. And um, the, this is the turning point for the pharmaceutical industry in, uh, in Kenya. In 2014, Kenya GMP roadmap was uh, launched. This was the stepwise approach for the pharmaceutical industry to attain WHO GMP standards. Under the UNIDO project, I must emphasize 
that we are looking at that time, the look was how can Kenya become to be different from the industry and develop more uh, global um, or international oriented manufacturing sector, which could uh, uh, be supply drugs anywhere based on WHO GMP standards. 2014, after these activities, United, uh, Universal was listed as a UNICEF global supplier, the only company at that time from Africa. 2016, Strides acquired controlling shares in uh, Universal. And then 2018, there's another turning point. We had the big four agenda, priority programs to reform the, the sectors, the industrialization sector and focused on food security, affordable housing, manufacturing, and affordable health. The local industry was a beneficiary because it fell under manufacturing and also under affordable health for all. In 2019, we had uh, um, the first local manufacturing industry manufacturer now with the WHO uh, pre-qualification was again uh, Universal Corporation. And that is why you see today, uh, uh, remember the first company to get into this area was Cosmos, but the first company to get WHO pre-qualification was uh, Universal. There are reasons and good reasons for that matter uh, why, uh, uh, on this issue of uh, WHO pre-qualification, a subject matter that requires another time to discuss. At the moment, we are now in another era of uh, uh, bottoms. Um, this is a bottoms uh, 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 up economy and there's now called a, a better a, a policy framework to promote socioeconomic liberation and improve the lives of uh, Kenyans. Having said that, I just shortly uh, say that we have moved quite, the country has moved quite uh, steadily ahead. At the moment, I'm informed, there are over 30 listed companies who have applied for registration as manufacturers. The licensed ones are about 30 to 40. So we are talking about 70 manufacturers if all of them uh, go through. Uh, from foreign investment, direct foreign investment, about five. Of course, we still have WHOPQ as one company. But we have a couple of others who have uh, about 25 with GMP level of um, uh, standards. Of course, um, we Biovax has been uh, established to manufacture the mRNA vaccines, and it should be uh, shortly, maybe hopefully this year or next year we should have a vaccine manufacturer for human uh, vaccines. As I said, we have uh, high government support. The industry is growing. There's increased number of foreign investors. The new investors have opened a new page because they are starting their operations at a better GMP concepts than previously. And a prime, we have reached a prime time for innovative, innovative products and technology transfer. And I think that will be our next uh, air, uh, development uh, um, agenda or in the pharmaceutical industry. Just to mention a little about how we perform on the export, we are exporting, and this has been steadily rising up, save for the decline uh, uh, post-COVID pandemic, uh, when the growth reduced a bit from 17% in 
in 2018 to about 13.5 um, in 2022. But the, <clears throat> the export market is too big, it's growing, it's still growing. I've mentioned the decline was there due to COVID. But then we need to say the local manufacturers, they need to promote the farmer products beyond Kenya and on the export market. When we see a number of uh, manufacturers coming on board, there is no point of competing on a, a domestic round. We need to compete much more on the export market and then become uh, a net exporter or, or, of uh, pharmaceutical products. Local manufacturers need to negotiate for export scheme and incentives related to that. I think that uh, we uh, the, the, the FKPM is alive and kicking, and I think it has very good uh, strong leadership. And we need then together with the PSK see how you can then be able to negotiate for the export market. I don't want to add anything more than that. Thank you very much for listening. I'm just happy to be with you. Over to you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Wanyanga for that insightful presentation. Uh, now we'll now move next to our next presenter. That is uh, Mr. Ranjan. Mr. Ranjan, if you can hear me. Uh, you can yes, share your... I can hear you. Okay, I'll share the presentation and yes, probably please. can speak on it. Good evening to all of you. Thanks to Dr. Ezron. Uh, let and... me know if you can see the screen. Yes. Is the screen visible to everybody? Yes, it is. Okay. Thanks to Dr. Wang Yan for giving us wonderful insight about the Kenya pharmaceutical industry from a distributor to a manufacturer and to the exporter of the drug. It is a long way that Kenya as a country has come up to the age where they are starting to set up a facility for the vaccine domestically manufactured, which is going to be a very big game change for the local population. My name is Abheranjan. I am from Elomatic. And today we will be speaking on a presentation about facilitating the end game of GMP facility. Switch. Yogesh, can you switch over to next? So Elomatic is my company. And this is about my four colleagues, including me, we are present in this call. As I said, my name is Abhay Ranjan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Elomatic India. And Elomatic India take care of the African market. And I would like to say that we are fortunate that in past we have worked with Universal, we have worked with Cosmos, and as well as with Alice Chemicals. Uh, with me, my another colleague is Yogesh Chobe. He is a general manager, process and regulatory. He has a fantastic experience of the shop floor manufacturing, research, audit, regulatory. He will be the main speaker today. My another colleague is Rika. She is our sales and business development manager from Elomatic Finland. She is joining from Finland. And she has about 25 years of experience in various segment of pharmaceutical industry, starting from the project management, product development, business development in the pharmaceutical industry. <clears throat> Hi, my, everyone. Fourth, my fourth colleague is Ujjal Datta. He's a vice Hello. president business development, and he has about 25 years of experience in capital equipments and tanky projects. We can move to the next. 
Alomatic is basically a company from Finland and we are a designing and engineering consultancy company. This company was established in 1970 and this is still a family owned business. As a team, we are about 1300 spread across the world in different parts of the world. We, ha we have executed the projects in about 80 plus countries. And our turnover is about 102 million euro. And we offer you complete end-to-end -end engineering and the designing. And we chose this topic to speak on the GMP facility because we facilitate in building the GMP facility. After this, I will hand over to my colleague, Yogesh Chobe, and he will take you through the rest of the presentation. Yogesh, to you. You are on mute. Thanks, Abhi. Thanks once again. Uh, thanks for the crispy introduction uh, about the team members. Uh, from here, I'll take the presentation forward. So for the sake of uh, bit saving, I'll switch off my video and I'll continue the presentation. So we'll try and understand a certain important and critical topic which governs the success of a GMP facility. We'll go into the roots of critical aspects of design, why a GMP facility is impacted if risk assessment exercise is not completed as a prerequisite. We'll also focus on impact of design failure. In a broader umbrella, we will touch base ISV approach of GMP facility. Last but not the least, as an experienced engineering design company, we will walk through Alomatics approach for design and project management, as well as commissioning and qualification. So when we say quality by design, what, what do we mean by quality by design? Entire points covered in the presentations are important, and I would emphasize more on critical aspects in the presentation. Drug plays important role in public health care to ensure safety, efficacy, and quality of the drug produced. Manufacturers need to have a quality and consistency of drug to achieve, which cannot be achieved without qualified facility, environment, systems, and procedures. URS to an end goal. When we say what is a URS, it is user requirement specification. And many a times it is seen only as a document and not as a critical input to the design. Ad hoc decisions, decisions which are taken without appropriate evaluation of the end results are impacting the quality by design and hence it is a no-go. Quality by design also helps the manufacturer to reach the market in a faster way. Quality by design is also important to be in a regulatory frame. GMP is mandatory which is good manufacturing practice, uh, which is a combination of good engineering practices as well as good documentation practices. By having QBD, we reduce product recalls, we, we results in a better ROI, which is return on investments and project economics. GMP, good manufacturing practices. What is GMP and why it is important? Drugs are not 100% tested. That is the that is the one of the critical point wherein all the drugs which have manufactured in the facility, we only do a sampling which represents the entire batch, but they are not 100% tested. GMP is to avoid mix-up, contamination, cross-contamination of the drugs, and the end users are not able to access the quality of the drug. The consumer who are popping up the pill or who are taking up the injections and the uh, dispensary or in the hospitals, they are not able to access the quality of drug. That is why GMP is very, very essential. GMP avoids errors 
Proper design and human error is avoided by following appropriate GMP. Regulatory expectation is quality should be built in the product and it cannot be by testing of the product. If we want to run a business in, in a regulated market or in a local market as well, then we need to address the local guidelines as well as international guidelines. The, the slide is self-explanatory, wherein we see levers around which GMP revolves, people, product, process, procedure, premises. Failure or gap in any one of the lever will result in undesirable results like design implementation, qualification, stability failures. GMP spectrum. What do we mean by GMP spectrum? All points covered below has to be critically evaluated to have a GMP complied successful facility designed and executed. We cannot miss any of the one during designing and implementation phase. For example, if we say premises, equipment and system, we need to consider each and every aspect given in this GMP spectrum to be evaluated to the point so that it will not have an impact on designing and implementation of a GMP facility. We move to the next slide. Challenges during design and implementation. Here we will spend a little more time in understanding. Business strategy changes from design stage, which is planned 20 to 24 months before, depending upon the size of the facility to the implementation stage. At a design stage, there are certain business strategies which are changed and later on after 20 to 24 months. So this is a challenge. Incomplete technological process or product information. For example, if a manufacturer had decided to add one more product in the same facility at the time of implementation, which was not considered earlier, that again, it comes as a challenge. Ideas are brainchild and inflow of the same results in multiple decision changes. Very important, GMP is dynamic. The regulations are being kept upgrading all the times. Hence, we call it as a current good manufacturing practice and not best manufacturing practice. A lack of coordination. And this is again very, very important. A multiple cost functional discipline of working on the project, namely civil, architecture, process, mechanical, HVAC, electrical, instrumentation, automation, fire, and so on. Each discipline have their own services which need to be appropriately rooted to have a clash-free clash design implementation during execution stage. There are certain gap in team's understanding and mindset from a different perspective. Sometimes individual team members have their own GMP understanding and want to design and execute with their fancy way without consulting the other team members, which is responsible for building up a GMP facility. Top-down strategy, right from the top level management to the executionist level, we need to have a common understanding of building a qualified GMP compliance facility. We'll move to the next slide. A critical aspect of design. When we say end to end, we say right from the receipt of the material, quarantine, sampling, testing, release or reject, dispensing, formulation, fill finish and dispatch. So from a material which is coming into the facility and the end product which is exiting of the facility, everything has to be considered when we are designing any of the GMP facility. We need to have a clear understanding on the PFD and other critical support required to complete the unique operations. When we say PFD is a process flow diagram wherein uh, at each unit operation stage, we know the material is going move, material is being moved from one stage to the another unit operation, and it may require a different support functions like temperature, like air classification. 
So we need to have a clear understanding on the PFDs. We need to have a defined responsibility matrix. Why it is very important is we cannot change the design at any given point of stage. Yes, if it is required, then we have a predefined responsibility matrix when we know who is the initiator and from initiator to approver from the, for the smooth design implementation and smooth operations. Uh, I would also like to emphasize on design and maintenance engineering expertise. Although maintenance engineers are handling day-to-day -day routine operations, it requires a different skill set of design engineering to know fluid dynamics, heat load, ergonomical and safety level. So there is a slight bit, little bit of difference between a design engineer and a regular maintenance engineer. Quality culture. Earlier, the concept was based on quality assurance level. And now there is a paradigm shift from top management to execution level expert. Uh, quality cannot be built in by a quality assurance uh, system or by, by a quality assurance team only. It has to be built in to the each and individual personnel who are working in the GMP facility. Continuous learning and training. This is a very important aspect wherein we learn, we train people to do a safe operation, safe unit operation pertaining to the quality and efficacy of the product. Last but not the least, due consideration should be given to the access accessibility of the maintenance of the system. Why I am saying this is if a machine or a system is placed appropriately in the designated and designed space in a layout, but what if there is no space for doing the maintenance of this machine? This will result in making design null and white. Here I will emphasize only on one line, which is DNA of the design is process and regulatory. If we know the process, if we know the regulations, we will be able to define and design a very good GMP facility. These are certain aspects which are also built around the facility layout like process, equipment arrangement, personal flow, material flow, CGMP, operational access and maintenance access. We'll also see layout. Um, my opinion is layout is not only a skill, but is also an art of combining process and architecture team in a multiple ways of arriving at an optimal layout based on the application. Now, if you see, there are various application-based facilities in the market, which has been designed and implemented. Formulation. Only the formulation part will be done in the factory, in the GMP facility, wherein the bulk will be purchased and it will be diluted, it will be formulated and it will be fill finished. There are facilities which are only making API. API is nothing but active pharmaceutical ingredient or also known as drug substance. Facilities having sterile and non-sterile applications, uh, injections, oral solid doses form, oral liquid doses form, topical applications, etc. Biopharmaceuticals, biosimilars, biotechs, vaccines, special doses like microspheres, lysosomal enzymes. Now, there is again one more uh, different type of facilities we can categorize as a greenfield or a brownfield. Greenfield facility is a facility wherein we have a land, a barren land wherein we build up a facility. Brownfield is where we are having either a shell structure or a civil structure which has been made and we need to fit our GMP facility within this shell structure. Yeah, sometimes brownfield designing is a is little bit challenge, but if designed, if implemented appropriately, we do have a successful brownfield facilities as well. There are also a layout which manufactures multiple product or a single product based on a campaign or based on a cleaning frequency. Uh, it is seen that layout, if they are process oriented, wherein the process is uh, uh, the center of the facility, it is most acceptable by the 
regulatory authorities as well as by the people who are working. It not only helps, but it also gives us the idea of having a well-organized batches. People and equipment can perform in the same function area, capable to handle the production variation, disciplined and ease to switch over. We can move from one product to another product very easily if the layout is process oriented. And the disadvantage is uh, maybe sometimes it reduces the efficiency if it is a process oriented and there are higher consumptions of utilities if not used up to the optimum level. Uh, last line which I've highlighted, uh, only an experienced and expert designer will be able to differentiate between must to have feature in the facility and from nice to have feature from the facility. This is one of the uh, this is one of the uh, layout uh, which says that we are having a people who are entering from less cleaner area to more cleaner area and a critical process area. We have raw material which are coming out, which are coming in from a less cleaner area to more cleaner area and to a critical processing area. Similarly, way we are having in containers and closures, which are coming from less cleaner area to a more cleaner area and a critical process area. This results in a very good flow of the product. It comes from one side and exits from the other side. Uh, on the on the other side, we have uh, two layouts, uh, which is one is desirable layout and one is less desirable layout. When we say desirable desirable layout, it says that we have a uniform flow of man and material, wherein we are receiving a material from one end, and it is processed and it is exiting the facility from the other end. On the other end, we see the receiving and unloading dock and loading dock from the same side wherein the material will be entered into the facility and the finished goods will be leaving the facility. So this is the less desirable layout. A few other critical aspects of uh, design, process engineering, pharmaceutical water system and HVAC. Uh, we will take one by one. We will, we will choose process engineering first. Uh, the design engineer needs to know the flow of the product. He needs to know the process flow absolutely correct to define and design the proper facility with the unit operation within. Closed system, whether it is a open system or closed system, whether it is a single use system, whether it is a multiple use system, depending upon the system which has been chosen, it is designed. Uh, defining sterile boundaries for specifically for sterile operations. The closer the sterile boundaries to the receiving vessel, much the better is. Cleaning and sterilization, depending upon the process requirement. Regulatory perspective comes into the mode wherein we need to enter which market. Uh, process automation is a uh, tool which helps to minimize the human error. When we say pharmaceutical water system, depending upon the source of water, whether it is a surface water, ground water, or treated water, the water system needs to be designed appropriately. Pharmaceutical, wa pharmaceutical water systems is used as a universal solvent in pharma and biotech for formulations and cleaning operations. So hence, we need to be very, very sure that Output of the water quality meets the USP, which is nothing but United States pharmacopoeia. It should be devoid of microbial organisms. It should be devoid of dissolved impurities, undissolved impurities. And we should also consider whether there are seasonal and regional variations that also need to be considered while designing the pharmaceutical water system. HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, and air, condi air condition. This uh, has to be appropriately designed with the heat load, number of people present in the clean rooms or warehouse, what kind of operation is being taken into that suite and whether it requires a pressure control, whether it requires a cascade effect. It has to be visualized at the design stage. 
Uh, HVAC gives us the environment which controls the particulate matter and which in turn gives the safety of the product. It gives, gives the safety to the person who is working inside the area or in the facility. When we see uh, what are the, again, critical aspects with respect to the completeness, correctness, composite, and cost. How do we define completeness? I'll give example of uh, whether all the drawings which are issued as a good for construction are up to the mark with respect to the initiator to a poor, whether it is complete in all the sense. Correctness. The details listed in the drawings or documents are verified for its correctness whether the entered detail, whether the calculation which has been made, whether the estimation which has been done, whether they are correct to the point, that has been checked. All disciplines of project manager like process engineering, HVAC, mechanical, project management, electrical, instrumentation are coordinating on a common platform for arriving about to completeness and correctness. So if by completing about three, we can reduce the cost. And now someone will ask us how it can reduce the cost. Because if the drawings, if the design is complete in all respect, if it is correct in all respect, and if all other multidisciplinary functions have already coordinated it, we don't have to go for a rework at site. Hence, it will reduce the cost. And when we add all fours, all four, we will get a facility which will be a GMP compliance facility. We'll little bit touch base on risk analysis and management at design stage. This is uh, one of the emerging uh, requirement from the regulatory uh, bodies. It is very crucial to do. Uh, I will not go to the definition which has been given on the upper part, but what are the perspective which includes uh, to do a risk analysis and risk management at design stage. I have also covered a slide wherein uh, the risk analysis or risk quality risk assessment has been done at the production shop floor stage. So when we are designing a new facility systems equipments, we need to take care of the design of the facility, whether it has already undergone a risk assessment, whether the contamination can be proved fatal to the person who are working, whether the containment has been done appropriately, that risk has been already evaluated. Designing of equipment, failure of equipment, whether we have consider the failure of equipment in the risk analysis, qualification of facility and systems, what are the approaches which are available and which approach we are going to adopt that has been already taken into the consideration, calibration and preventive maintenance, computer systems, computer control equipments. These are all falling under the purview of risk analysis and management at a design stage. If we also want to see a uh, quality risk management and production shop floor, uh, what is QRM? QRM is nothing but assessment, control, communication, and periodic review of this. I have take, taken an example of APQR, which is nothing but annual product quality review, in that what is expected to be reviewed, the starting material, critical in process material, speed, temperature, pressure, finished product results, assay, impurities, a review of, of all batches that are passed under deviation, whether there is a deviation in the environment, whether there is a personal failure that has to be reviewed. Review of all non conformance related to the investigation and CAPA. CAPA is nothing but providing corrective action and preventive action such that this kind of non conformance will not again happen in the facility. Uh, when doing APQR, we need to also need to check the qualification status of HVAC, water system, compressed air, gases, etc. We need to also review the complaint and recalls if we have any. We need to review all OS, OOT, and failures. OS is nothing but out of trend and out of strain, stability, and failures. Out of specification and out of trends, failures, and also be taken into the policy quality risk management. Now, when we come to this slide, uh, none of the companies investing in building a compliance facility will be interested to see these points. But yes, this is this is a prevailing in the market. If there are design failure, it will have a cascading impact. We may produce the drugs of incon inconsistency or inconferior, inf inferior quality. 
we can also have an product recall the products which are designed to have a shelf life of three years may might have come down because the it is having an impact on the design it will also have an impact on the operator's health regulatory audit business revenue market goodwill loss of opportunity negative impact of cash flow of the business and employees uh, most importantly the come back to the normal running from the failure will take cost and time for, for upgradation and reworking of the desired facilities. So these are some of the impact of design failure if a GMP facility is not designed appropriately. If we see ISPE, ISP is nothing but International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineer. ISPE, Commissioning and Qualification Baseline, Volume 5, Second Edition, gives different approaches for qualifying GMP facilities, whether it is a risk-based approach, focus on formulation of sterile and non-sterile, like I said, steriles are injections, eye drops, non-steriles are so, or oral solid doses form, oral liquid doses form, topical applications, API, biologics, biopharmaceuticals. Uh, we will get into the more of CQV and quality systems. Training and development is very, very important, uh, which is emphasized here in ISP as well. Uh, we have also seen as it is one of the important lever of GMP, wherein we discussed the five levers of the, the GMP. Uh, Alumetics approach, uh, uh, any, any uh, design, designing of facility starts with the concept design and ends with the implementation and handover. So if we divide the entire management, project management, it will be consisting of CD, BD, DD, and implementation. Concept design, basic design, detailed design, and implementation. We can also see project management and quality and safety management starts from the concept design and ends to the implementation. If we break down the project management into further, we have engineering requirements, wherein the requirements from clients are clearly understood and discussed and agreed upon. For example, the annual output of the cap capacity, annual output of the facility has been already been frozen. This will be frozen this as one of the assumptions to design the facility. Then once the requirements are clearly understood and frozen, the team will do the calculations and will arrive at the BOQ. BOQ is nothing but a bill of quantities. And then we'll move to the next stage of the project management, which is procurement management. This involves technical bid analysis and commercial bid analysis. Uh, Analytic will help the client or customer to choose the appropriate vendor depending on the numbers which has been given in the technical bid analysis where there are four or three vendors approaching to complete the BOQ and to complete the process uh, based on the numbering system, which one is the better, which will be highlighted by the Alomatic, which will help in choosing appropriate vendor and appropriate contract supervisor at site. Construction management, taking a full control of the requirement at the site of all disciplines of project manager and progress of site. Uh, commissioning and qualification, I'll take into the next next slide. But I would like to insist here, uh, uh, one point is why Alomatic? Why do we feel, why why there is a need to say that Alomatic is, the, we have a trained team, we have a diversified qualified team. What do we mean by diversified qualified team is, we have team members from microbiology, we have team members from electronics, we have team members from chemical engineering, pharmacy, from mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, civil engineer, structural engineer, design engineer. So that is why I say diversified qualified, diversified qualified team, rich in experience on project management, as well as from the production shop floor. We have excellent subject matter expert. Understanding client's need with respect to the GMP cost and project designing and implementation. Seamless execution of design, last but not the least, more than five decades of experience in designing the facilities. 
we'll move to one of the very important V model approach for commissioning and qualification. If we see the four heads, we can see design, construction, qualification, and maintenance. This is the life cycle of the project, wherein we design, we construct, we qualify, and we maintain. V model approach gives us the flexibility to choose the appropriate process and systems which will be used and qualified to the entire life cycle. Uh, commissioning and qualification. What is the difference between commissioning and what is the difference between qualification? Commissionings are the systems which will be commissioned and which will not be qualified. Why some systems are only commissioned and are not qualified? Because based on the classification of the systems, there are eight questions which says that if the answer of any of the eight questions is yes, they are impacting system. So the impacting system, impacting the quality of the systems, impacting the quality of the product will undergo a qualification. And the non-impacting system like boiler, chillers, compressor, they are non-impacting systems. They will be checked only at the clean room levels, but not at the generation levels. So that is the difference between uh, qualification and commissioning. Uh, team will also support in commissioning and engineering runs during FAT and SAT. If you see the arrows are two-sided, it is not only one-sided. That means we can go, we can upgrade our user requirement, we can upgrade our functional requirement, we can upgrade our design specification as we upgrade within the, within the project. Last leg, if you see the maintenance, it is a routine cycle. What we do is we do a requalification, we do a change control, we do a preventive maintenance, we do a periodic recalibration of the of the of the entire facility. Here are some of the references which I have taken uh, from which which I have taken from WHO GMP, UNX one, US FDA guidance. ISP baseline, PICS guideline to construct a GMP facility which is complying in all the manner. Here are some, some of our values. We succeed together. We have passion to improve. We are trustworthy. What is the purpose of Alumatic? We design solutions that increase environmental and human well-being and improve the competitiveness of our customers. We are constantly developing our top competence for the benefit of our customers. This is our vision. We want to supply industry with design and expert services, software and turnkey deliveries based on technologies we have developed. Our goal is to be an international recognized top expert that our customers that our customer values. What is our what is our contribution to a sustainable group development? We design solutions that increase environmental and human well-being. We know that we can have an impact on the environment and carbon neutral future with the daily design work we carry out for our customers. It's very simple when it is time to face the future, uh, face it with Alomatic. Here I end my uh, presentation. Thank you, Yogesh. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yogesh and uh, Mr. Ranjan for that uh, insightful presentation from Alomatic and uh, what you do. So at this point, we'll just jump into the Q&A session. Uh, and I'd like to remind our attendees, if you have any questions, uh, kindly share them on the Q&A tab. They'll be responded to at the end of at the, at this session. So uh, we have the first question uh, that goes to Dr. Wanyanga. And um, this is from Dr. Salim, who says, uh, thank you for the brief regarding the farmer journey in Kenya. And uh, he has a concern on um, why we have uh, one WHO certified pharma industry and 25 GMP, which are compli which are GMP compliant industries. And uh, why is it that they've not taken up the role of uh, manufacturing uh, ARVs and anti-TBs and anti-malarial? 
given that the burden of malaria, HIV, and TB is still high in Kenya. So maybe you can give a response to that, Dr. Onyango. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. I'll uh, approach it this way. Number one is uh, WHOPQ is an expensive journey. And that journey is dictated also by two things. The items which have been chosen by WHO, where and, uh, ARVs and malarials fall, and also the expression of interest from the manufacturer. So if you have not expressed the interest for uh, PQ, then you, 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 you are not on the list to be considered. Having done that and uh, undergoing the, the, the pre-qualification uh, process, which takes time, I think uh, to my experience, uh, it takes between, uh, from the time you apply to the time your uh, company's uh, gate will take as long as uh, four or five years or even more. We have companies which have taken even more and they have not achieved uh, that. Now, the and TB medicines, those ones require just uh, um, uh, high level of GMP and quite a number of companies and especially one in Kenya, Cosmos has been supplying that for a long time. Uh, the uh, only company in Kenya with the PQ is un uh, universal. And that tells you that from the time they got it up to now, it has not been easy. So it also depends on the, on the policy of the company, whether you need to, uh, to, 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 to invest a little bit more both in terms of uh, um, equipment, infrastructure, and personnel, and that's what really makes it expensive. You realize the companies that have gotten it uh, were in partnership with other companies uh, in India who had already WHO PQ, and it became a little bit uh, smoother and easier to process that requirement. Otherwise, I would say that uh, if we are to talk about WJPQ and WJGMP, you find some little bit of what I call professional double standards. Because the companies which have produced, uh, which, which have been supplying uh, uh, the Kenyan market and the East African market and so forth are deemed to be um, doing well with GMP. But when it comes to now the other element, then the same companies uh, can be able to supply the generic medicines which they do except the um, ARVs and, and malarials. There are certain good reasons for that. But we needed to have uh, had a situation where we collaborate together to make sure that the companies which have achieved and which have been supplying the government and the public sector and even the private sector and exporting that are GMP wise right can then be given a, 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 an ability, a, a program, a scheme to which they can now graduate from that to that. But when they are left on their own, it means they have got to look at some other considerations, especially in terms of uh, uh, investment. And one other thing is there's no guarantee that if you achieve that after investment, you'll get your, your invoice. So that is a deterrent that you invest so much, but still you are, you, you are subjected to competing with other manufacturers. So the interest has been low because of some of those reasons and uh, more reasons. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Anyanga, for that feedback.
Um, I think we'll go to the next question, uh, which is from Dr. Okoth, who says, uh, can quality by design facility uh, done handle sterile products used to handle biologicals? If yes, what are what are the levels of documentations required? Yeah, so, I'll take, I would like to take this uh, question, uh, Dr. Okay. Azra. Yes, quality by design will definitely uh, be able to take the sterile products. And now, when we when we have gone through the presentation, we say right from the URS, URS is uh, user requirement specification till the handover. It comes at a very different levels of documentation. We we cannot define at this stage that by having twenty percent more of documentation, we will be able to do a QBD of a sterile facility. It is an holistic approach. We'll have to refer the ISP base guide or WHO base guide, wherein details of leveling of documentations are clearly spelled out, and we need to we need to follow it. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and the next one is from uh, I think it's for you again, Mr. Yogesh. Yep. Um, Shetty, Divya Shetty says, um, "Lovely presentation." And the question is, uh, "Is water?" Is wastewater management a part of uh, waste management in GMP spectrum? Is it designed in-house or externally? Thank you, Divya, for your praise. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, you just need to uh, give us the details of the affluent, and we as a design engineer will design a water management system for you. Uh, nowadays, uh, regulatory agencies are looking for a zero level discharge from a facility, which means whatever water we have used within the facility has to be reused again back into the facility. That means no contamination as in wastewater can go out from the facility to outside the area, polluting the area. Yes, it can be designed. It can be designed uh, by the experts like us. We only need to have some parameters, affluent parameters, and we can design that wastewater management for you. I hope I have answered your query, Divya. Yes, yes. Um, and just maybe for the uh, for other speakers, Dr. Anyanga, Ujal, Ranjan, and uh, Rika, if you have any other comments, uh, feel free to just uh, jump in uh, for any of those questions. Sure. Yeah. This and is then, good uh, from Yogesh. The, the explanation is good. Okay, now, okay. Divya has a, one more small question in the same, uh, whether it should be designed in-house or it can be done externally. So both the options are there. Uh, most of the time, it is always uh, desirable to have in-house in the in the factory itself. But if it is not possible, then you can have a primary treatment in in the in the factory. And for the secondary and the tertiary treatment, it can be taken to the common effluent treatment plant if your industrial shade or the industrial area is having that facility. Otherwise, it has to be done within the facility. Thanks, Abhay. All right, thank you. Um, the following question is uh, from Dr. Juliet Konje, uh, who's asking, what about use of green energy in pharma manufacturing? What is your experience? And is it doable and sustainable? For example, the use of solar energy. I, I, I'll transfer this question to Abhay, probably. Uh, he'll be in a better so, situation than this. Okay, yes, we can, use the, we can use the solar energy but you know, uh, for the pharmaceutical production, we need a non-interrupted supply of the power. So there are a couple of pharmaceutical manufacturing unit in India where they are using solar. But what they do is they generate the electricity and give it back to the state government or the local uh, state agency and take a benefit, commercial benefit in their metering, in their bill from the, from the government. So yes, it is a kind of a byproduct which can be given back to the electricity board and you can reduce your electricity bill. But it cannot be consumed directly in your factory. Is it? All right. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. I don't know if there's any comments. Dr. Anyanga, Ujo. No, no, no. I don't have anything to add there except to say the, I mean, I'm wondering why give it back and take it back. Why don't you bank it? Um, I would rather I would I, 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 I'm, I'm, I would be interested to see whether the rooftops of all these pharmaceutical industries in here in Kenya 
we're having all the sunshine and being wasted, they can uh, save that energy in the energy banks. And then you can be able to use um, uh, maybe for lighting purposes. And then uh, for heavy machinery, you can then uh, uh, use the other one. So it saves on the electricity bill, which is quite uh, high in this country. And that consideration would be worthwhile. Yes. Further to add to you, electricity is out of the GMP preview. So whatever electricity we can produce by putting the solar panels on the terraces, it is very good energy. And it can be used for the secondary application like the street lights and the other application. But the best is that we give it back to the state or the local uh, electricity supply board and take the rebate or take the discount on, on the electricity bill. This is a very routine practice which is being adopted in, in Indian pharmaceutical industry. Okay. All right, thank you for that feedback. Uh, we have another question um from someone who's asking do you recommend low level return rises or top return in manufacturing corridors and secondary packaging hall okay during my presentation i stressed that there are certain team members who want to implement their uh, their own fancy of gmp so unless and until we know uh, what is the type of products which we are manufacturing in that corridor the implementation of the top riser or uh, uh, below risers is totally based on that process engineering. So it is not like a thumb rule saying that, okay, it is good to have a top mounted riser or it is bad to have a uh, low mounted risers. It is based on process engineering. I, I think, I hope, I hope I answered yes. the question. All right, See, thank you. The question um, is also saying about the return risers. So return risers is always good to be in lower place because the they will take the air from the lower section of the clean room and drive it out of the factory. But what Yogesh is saying, correct, that it is uh, very difficult to reply like this until unless we are clear what is the application we are talking about. Thanks, Abhay. Yeah, yeah, and also to add on to Abhay and Yogesh, like normally nowadays CFD analysis is becoming a very uh, practice, a more important practice to calculate okay the what kind of airflow we are getting a proper efficiency. So normally nowadays people are trying to do the CFD, computational fluid dynamics. So that is playing a very important role wherever you are coming up with some injectable facilities where class A, class B is very prominent. So normally this kind of CFD is also very helpful. Right. All right, thank you for that. Um, I think there's an important question here from uh, Dr. Eric, who's asked, who says, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentations. And uh, to the Lomatic team, do you have a local Kenyan office where we can get your services? Uh, yes, actually, uh, to answer this question, we have a local partner uh, in uh, Nairobi. And uh, like they are like, if, uh, like our friend uh, contacts with the local clients. And uh, anytime anybody has any any sort of technical questions, if somebody wants to come up with a new facility or upgradation in the new facility or design support or even CQV support, for example, we are very much there. We are very much accessible. We have our local partner, DLA Scientific. And they are uh, our local partners who can be a direct contact to the client as well. All right. And maybe in connection to that, uh, there's a question on now uh, from Dr. Daniel Karimi who's asking, what capacities do you have in supporting uh, tech transfers and what uh, are the common challenges you come across? Yes. yes the, see, now tech transfer, if I understand, is basically the doziest. Now you have two sectors. One is pharmaceutical and another is the biologicals. So when you talk about pharmaceuticals, you have general category products, you have containment category products. So we also can very well support our clients with uh, CTT dosiers uh, based on what kind of products they are looking for. We will support with the dosiers plus uh, uh, if they have a facility which is ready, we will also support them to take trial batches at their factory and also help you in sourcing the raw material as well and taking the analytical batches with that specific product. We can do that support for you to the client. All right, thank you so much. And maybe with that, uh, I don't. I, I hope you'll be coming to the expo as well. Um, maybe I just need to remind our members uh, that this this webinar is uh, 
we, we, it's a pre-expo webinar. Uh, we'll be having a, an expo that is coming up that is uh, organized by our partners. And uh, the expo is the seventh farmer expo. It will be happening at KCC on 3rd and 4th of uh, October. So maybe will you be having, will you will your team be available in that expo? Uh, we, we are trying actually, we may be out of country during that time, but sir, we will try. We'll try our best. Okay, okay. Maybe with that, you could also just uh, share your contact details on the chat uh, for anyone who yes. would like to reach out to you. I will write and send it, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll write and send it. No problem. Okay, okay. So there's another question here from Dr. Muduri, who's uh, asking if you could kindly explore, expo expound more on URS and VMP. Maybe Mr. Yugesh. Sorry, what was the question? VMP, uh, URS is nothing but uh, user required specification. And VMP is nothing but validation master plan. So whenever we are writing a URS for the facility or the equipment, we, we differentiate the requirements as in quality requirement, business requirement, regulatory requirement, or a safety requirement or a IT requirement. So when we write our URS in such a detailed differentiation, we know what are the levels or what are the action points which we need to qualify rather than qualifying which is a business requirement qualifying which is a safety requirement qualifying which is a, a non uh, quality product or non quality generated requirements so when you write a urs you bifurcate those points and you only stick to the points which are affecting the quality and you only qualify those so that is the importance of writing a urs in a very well structured manner and VMP is nothing but validation master plan. For every facility, we need to have an a VMP, which is validation master plan, which uh, which doesn't list the uh, the all the type of equipments which we are having and how we are validating it. It gives a general overview of what would be the validation approach of that facility. So it is it is a must uh, requirement uh, if any a GMP auditor or GMP regulator is coming to audit our facility. Uh, they will insist on seeing this uh, VMP, which is nothing but validation master plan. We can see, we can give more information if you have specific questions on val validation master plan. We do make a VMP for our clients, depending upon the type and size of the facility. Actually, to add on to Abhay, uh, sorry, to add on to uh, Yogesh as well, like uh, CQB is very important, uh, plays a very important role in any pharmaceutical and biotech facility and we, uh, we follow the ISP, like the V model philosophy, where the first most important step is the validation master plan and the risk assessment, which completely defines what kind of risk you may have by uh, with this facility, the design, and how you will try to mitigate that by having a strong, robust VMP, followed by the URS, then your DQ, IQ, OQ protocols, then FAT, SAT protocols, and also we help you, uh, support you during the supervision of this IQ, OQ activities at the site completely. So it's like a broader spectrum in case any of the clients, any of the uh, pharmacists locally require any kind of support, we are, we are there. That is one of the very crucial service we offer to our clients. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that feedback, Dr. Yogesh and uh, Duta. So uh, the next question is uh, from Dr. Samuel Moniki, who who's asking what would be your advice on using pretreatment approach borehole water for, for usage in uh, sterile manufacturing? Uh, are we saying that we the question is to reuse the water in the sterile manufacturing? Uh, uh, the answer is no. Uh, no, it's that uh, if you have a source as a borewell water and you want to understand what kind of Initial treatment. water treatment or the pretreatment to be done. That is totally based on the water analysis because normally in the sterile uh, injectables you require a very stringent uh, uh, water feed. Also, the final water quality like your WFI, your uh, your purified water, then PSD. So that totally depends on what kind of water source and water quality you have. So we will accordingly we will propose the the, the water treatment scheme, the initial pretreatment either DM RO or it's a double uh, or UF if there is any colloidal content. So that totally depends on the water analysis uh, from your borewell. 
source of water. Uh, yeah, it it of totally water. depends it on the source of water. It can be a river water, it can be a borewell water or a lake water. The water analysis report plays a crucial role, sir, in that. So that will define what kind of treatment your plant needs to have it to achieve the, uh, the, the quality of the water that will be used in your production or in the process. All right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that. I would just say on, on water that it's become a big, uh, a, a major problem in the pharmaceutical industry because the water is never enough uh, from the um, uh, uh, public sources. And most of the manufacturers have got to uh, get a borehole. The only thing here is that uh, when you're digging, the, uh, making the borehole, you do not know the kind of water quality that is going to come out. So when it is quite uh, salted, then it means that uh, your purification system, uh, you will have to put in a, lo a lot more. But it's important to say that whether the water is coming from a borehole or whether it's coming from the public uh, source, the water for manufacturing must meet the requirements for manufacturing. So the choice is yours to look at some of these things, especially at the uh, uh, when you are just starting uh, the, 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 the designing your factory, and that is what it means also to you to to look at the user requirements so that you can be able then need to include the specifications uh, the the for 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 the bore, uh, borehole water rather than leaving it at the end, then you find that you, you, you still require it. So that, that it's important that, I mean, there's no excuse because the water must meet the requirements for pharmaceutical use. Yes, yeah. Thanks, right. Dr. Guinan. So there is a, the, for the quality uh, of water which need to be used for the sterile application, there's a standard by the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, it is called USP, and they have very clearly defined what kind of water quality we should have, which is called as a PUW or pharmaceutical water. And from the, as Ujjal said, uh, depend upon the analysis and the source of the water, you need to do the complete engineering for the pre-treatment till you get the PUW, the purified water which is further used for the generation of water for injection, WFI. And WFI is again used for creating the purified steam, PSG. Because when we are using the, when we are using the water for the sterile application, it is injectable or biopharmaceutical or the vaccines. So we use PUW, we use WFI and we use PSG. All the three components, all the different forms of the water. So this is a very stringent application and water is itself is very, very important for the for the pharmaceutical production. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, maybe we, um, due to time constraint, I think we'll take one last question. Um, just give me a moment. All right, uh, this question is, is from Dr. Henry, who is asking, um, he says uh, India is the global pharmacy. What do we need to do for Kenya to become a player in global pharma supply chain like India? Lovely question, uh, Mr. Henry, but it's very difficult to reply. I mean, it's a continuous effort. And today, India is called as a pharmacy of the world, but that is after 75 to 80 years of continuous effort. Today, if you see India, we, we have the complete ecosystem, whether it is with respect to the machinery, engineering, manpower, raw material, finished products. And that is true not only for the chemical synthetic drugs, but also for the biologics and the vaccine. So, I mean, I will only wish that you need to put up a continuous effort for the improvement in the total society. And uh, there is need to be a, a very clear cut roadmap for the for the upliftment of the manufacturing local manufacturing because until unless you have a local manufacturing it is very difficult to you know the uh, look at the kind of a hub for for supplying to the nearby countries so 
uh, wish you all the best. And this is very lovely question. I don't think I can uh, reply to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't know if you have any comment from Dr. Anyanga. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I know I've looked at India, and uh, they have done certain things, unusual, uh, which are good for them and uh, which are quite ingenious. Uh, just last week they are going to the moon, and uh, I, I I just uh, like that and uh, so forth. The whole thing in India is that is uh, the ecosystem is very good. And is supported by the political leaders and the business community, the industrialization aspect. In uh, the year 2000, around 2000, when Kenya was uh, being uh, evaluated by WTO for TRIPS agreement, we were we went to Geneva to sign the papers. India went to Geneva to say, we are not signing the papers, give us more time. Now, what were, what they had seen is uh, something that other countries were not seeing. They were looking at the patent rules, which they wanted to uh, not to be, uh, uh, to, to escape being caught up in the, in, in the cop web of uh, patentabilities and all those things. So they asked for more time so that they were they, they remained innocent. And in their innocence, they came up with the ARB, the, the, this combined uh, uh, combination therapy, which uh, other countries had not thought of, but for which single molecules had been patented in other areas. So they, they skipped that. And it's just a question of ingenuity and making sure that you are, you work together. Kenya, at the same time, uh, we were digging our own hole. Uh, we had come up with the Cameron, and uh, when we came up with the Cameron, which was also part of combination therapy, but we started fighting over small cake. And then the, 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 that fight took far too long that we lost the road to discovery, we lost the road to innovation. And what I encourage most of uh, the scientists in this country, let us look back home and ask ourselves, what is patentable, what is uh, innovative, and what is a discovery? Because these are the issues that uh, you have got to involve each and everybody. India had very sharp lawyers. The products which were patented here, they were not patented even in India because the lawyers were saying that is not an innovation. So you have got to get the whole train to moving together. And I think PSK, we need a, 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 think, a think tank forum where we can be able now to say, what is it? Why is it the industry is growing, but R&D is not growing. So what do we do from R&D so that we can now be able to come up with the uh, innovative uh, uh, products? Uh, when we had COVID, I suggested uh, this uh, use of uh, certain products and uh, people thought that uh, it, was a, it was a joke. But in the end, we are buying oxygen everywhere. And people were dying because they couldn't get that oxygen, uh, which you could uh, have uh, used other ways. And it's just because our R&D and our scientists, they forget where they are going and look at their desk on what is on the table rather than the food is outside the table. Don't look at the food on your plate. Look for the food that has not come on your plate. And that's where innovation comes from. How about you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the history. I mean, probably it's very old history what you are sharing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that feedback. Uh, I think we'll just have. Um, I see we have two questions, and I think it's it's good to just have them responded to. Maybe your guest you could respond to them. Um, there was one from uh, Katib. Who's, asked, who's saying uh, in sterile manufacturing, should air move from the rooms to 
to corrid to the corridor or should it be vice versa and uh maybe as you respond to that uh you could also give feedback to one who's asking do you recommend bean blender or octagonal blender and whether it should be kept in granulation granulation suite or in separate cubicle so maybe you could respond to those two last questions be before we give our closing remarks okay <clears throat> first I'll, I'll i'll answer i'll try to answer the question pertaining to the sterile facility wherein the question is asked whether it is good to have air flowing from the clean room to the corridor or from corridor to the clean room so uh, if we are uh, making a products like uh, uh, anti cancer products or hormonal products it is always safe to have uh, air moving from corridor to the clean room whereas the core area should be at a negative pressure and the corridor should be at higher pressure although the corridor and clean room should be of the same class and it is a vice versa it is exactly opposite if we are doing a general vaccines of sterile manufacturing, then the core area should be at higher pressure and the corridor should be at a lower pressure. Even though we can have a uh, design wherein corridors can, can be of an grades which are lesser than the clean room, a, a clean room gates like B or C, the corridors can be D or C and C. So it depends upon what the, the process which we do. Uh, how we have evaluated, how we have done the risk assessment of the facility before the facility is designed. We design whether the inflow is from corridor to clean room or clean room to corridor. Again, uh, coming back to the next question is whether you do you... Yeah, yeah, and to add on to Yogesh, like there is a concept called bubble concept and the same concept which is followed when we try to do the designing of this facility. Like there are change rooms like... I rightly you just said if there is any containment facility or if you're working with any biosafety level three facility, then it's a more challenge also in that case. So there is a bubble concept, the sink concept, then uh, box in box concept. So a lot of concepts comes into picture when we design. Like uh, we did not touch up the vaccine part. We have very rich expertise in designing vaccines facility, uh, with the, and even with the biosafety level three working globally. So in that also this kind of air movements, the clean room designs. Uh, the change room designs plays a very critical critical role expert. Yeah, Yogesh, please, go ahead. But just yeah, to add on that, uh, you, by the time you are designing, you need to know the product so that you can be able to know what yes. which, which, which one you are going to use. So yes. most of the time, uh, maybe I'll talk about that later, is uh, that if you don't know the product, yes. you don't know the, the technology you're going to use. And if you, because it's, it's different from product to product and process to process. Yeah, like it's when it comes to containment level, you have, sorry, for example, the OEL levels. It is a OEL level two, three, four, five. So that totally depends, uh, completely defines the design of the facility. Absolutely right. Yeah, sorry, you yeah. please. As, as I mentioned in my in my presentation, the, the challenges during design implementation is one of this challenge wherein we don't know the product at the initial stage where we have designed and there are changes at the later stage, implementation stage. What do we do now? Whether we need to have a positive corridor or whether we need to have a, a positive clean room. So if that is not clear at the beginning, that will be a, coming as a challenge. Uh, thanks, Ujjal, for adding to it. Now, second question is again, whether we should use bean blender or octagonal blender. Again, it depends upon what is the quantity which we are, which we are uh, processing within the manufacturing unit, whether it is a large quantity, whether it is a small quantity, whether it is a pilot plant, but it is a commercial plant. This again, I will always say that all engineering process has to be risk mitigated. We need to do the evaluation based on risk strategy and what is the outcome of the risk strategy on choosing the equipment you appropriately choose the equipment, whether it is an octagonal blender or whether it is a bean blender. Again, coming to the second question is whether it can be stationed within the same room. Uh, again, I will move back to the more uh, robust uh, approach, which is always saying that to have a risk mitigated approach evaluation. If we have done the risk evaluation, we can, we can keep both the equipment in the same room. So you need to follow an approach and you need to scientifically tell that this approach I have adopted and this doesn't have risk or even if it has a risk, it is a minimal risk and we will continue to pursue with that risk. With that risk. Uh, I don't know whether I have tried to answer yeah. that question. I will like to add to Yogesh to both the questions of sterile and 
uh, octagonal uh, blender. Mm -hmm. See, each plant is customized. It is not possible that you can have same equipment or same philosophy applicable to all the products or to all the projects. We have been doing so many projects every year and we are in business from last 50 years. But, you know, still for each project, there is a lot of discussion, a lot of brainstorming because it is varying. We, we act like a tailor and based on the customer requirement, based on the product requirement, based on the regulatory market you are addressing, the design solution or the selection of the machines will vary. So it's very difficult to say that X is better than Y or Y is better than Z. So this is 100% customized based on the application, based on the product, based on the process. And you can say we are like your tailor. So one size is not suitable for all. Great away. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for adding that important feature uh, to the answer. Away. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I see we are now out of time uh, for our speakers. Thank you so much for the invaluable information that you've given us. Uh, I'd just like to give you, each of you, 30 seconds to just give a parting shot before we go to the closing remarks. So maybe we could start with the Duta, you could just give some closing remarks, 30 seconds. Ujjal, that your time starts now. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the complete uh, the PSK team and also the GPO exports, Mr. Pranav and their team, for uh, giving us this opportunity to present to the Honorable uh, Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. And, of course, uh, it's a very interactive session. And, uh, okay, I understand uh, one hour is not sufficient to talk more on the facility design. It's a never-ending topic where we have a lot of things to offer on your table but however this is the first interaction and we are looking forward to work with the uh, the local industry the kenya pharmaceutical industry and also the vaccines and biotech industry where we can add a lot of technical values uh, that, you know, to the to the people and also to the country and how we can add value with respect to the complete pharmaceutical engineering so thank you so much uh, and the whole complete team and also uh, the complete attendees uh, in this session. Thank you for uh, listening to us. And we are like in my chat box, we have shared our email ID. If anybody has any queries in the near upcoming future, you are very much open and be flexible to reach us and we'll be happy to assist you. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a nice evening. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Yogesh. I think everything I wanted to tell Ujjal has already said on it. I, I thank to the organizers. I thank to the uh, attendees for asking uh, very brilliant questions uh, to test uh, our knowledge, our proficiency, and our experience in this field. Uh, thank you. And as Ujjal said, we look forward to work with you uh, in the near future. And we are always open for any kind of questions, any kind of help or support which is needed from our end. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, uh, Rika. Maybe you could give uh, your closing remarks as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting Elomatic and, and uh, my colleagues from Indian office to have this presentation. It was our pleasure to be part of this session, this webinar. And, and thank you, Dr. Banyanga, for the good introduction and interesting insights for, for the Kenyan pharmaceutical industry. Um, I think uh, all that I can say, it was good questions and good uh, good discussion. And I wish all the best for, for the future uh, and success in Kenya. And, and it's a great opportunity for Elomatic to hopefully be part of that. All right, thank you so much, uh, Saranjan. So thank you very much to complete PSK team and Mr. Purana Patel and his team. Thank you to the participants for such a entertaining, qualitative time given to us. And we are always available to serve you. Our contact details are shared in the, in the chat box. And I'm sure as Ujjal said that probably one hour is not sufficient. It's a very interesting topic. And uh, we will be always 
happy to reply back to you. You can reach to us on the email and uh, let us look forward if we can touch up sometime, if we can meet up sometime. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wanyanga. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for this platform. Uh, we have talked quite a bit and uh, my colleagues from uh, India and Finland, uh, I wish you're coming to Kenya so that we can shake hands together. Uh, for the Kenyan fraternity, I would say that uh, we need to rethink about our model for industrialization and uh, focus a little bit more on this validation ma master plan because most of the companies do not start at user requirements they do not start at design qualifications they do a little bit about the start installation when they don't know what is required of them because of the rented facilities that most companies have uh, uh, used because when you use a rented facility then you you are, you're already starting with a problem and uh, I would rather that uh, you can get some, when you're thinking about these areas, PharmaQ is available to have a chat with you and also to connect you with these great men, so that uh, men and women, so that we can be able to uh, get the next phase of industrial, pharmaceutical industrialization in Kenya uh, on the proper path. I would uh, think that this is a good beginning. I hope to see you next week during the exhibition. We shall be having uh, seminars uh, uh, during, and I hope to see you then. Uh, thank you, and bye-bye. Thanks to thank Dr. You. Well, then, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a very good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good thank evening to all of you. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye -bye. As we close, uh, thank you so much for our speakers. So uh, participants, as we close, uh, this is the expo that will be happening on 3rd and 4th of October. Uh, you are very much welcome to join us. Um, and uh, within that session, we'll also be having a seminar that will be covering infrastructure development, innovation and new technologies and promoting use of locally made products. This is going to be a seminar that will be ha happening within the expo so kindly we'll be sharing the registration link very soon uh also i've shared the registration link for the for the expo on the chat um maybe i could just share it once again if you've not registered kindly do that uh there is the link i've shared it again it's happening on 3rd to 4th of october at kicc so you're very much welcome. And for our partners for this webinar, GP Ex GPE Expo, uh, which is uh, the sponsor for this event and also the organizer for the 7th East Africa Pharma Expo. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, maybe just to let you know about another event that will be happening soon. Uh, we'll be having a webinar on uh, pharmacists in practice, which is in partnership with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. And uh, in this webinar, we'll be covering matters to do with practice. Um, you'll be informed about uh, variation, renewal of licenses, the new payment system. If you have any questions about uh, the practice department, you'll also have a chance to respond, to ask your questions, and also uh, matters to do with specialization in pharmacy. So kindly look out for that. We'll be sharing the registration link soon. The other thing to remember uh, to just note is that we'll be having a pharmacist meeting uh, for the pharmacists practicing in academia and research on 12th of October. We'll be having a meet and greet. So kindly look out for that as well. Thank you. Um, for our speakers, thank you so much. For our participants, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week in the expo. Thank you. Have a Bye. great Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.